Anyone see any good TV shows this week? Non-rhetorical question, I really do want to know. Anyone watch uh, Breaking Bad ended? Did anyone following that? That was the big deal. <laughs> good show? <laughs> good. So that, that was the TV. Anyone uh, read any good books this week? Any good? In the process, what, what are you reading? The Beast. The Beast. Yeah. Who wrote that? Okay. <laughs> Narrows it down nicely. Oh, the beast, okay. That's funny, so did I. Repeatedly. <laughs> it is an excellent book, Brown Bear, Brown Bear. Any, anyone see any great movies? Not a lot of movie goers around here, I'm guessing, but uh, yeah. Is there anything you have seen or read or watched lately that you want to go back to and see or watch or read again? Anything? You, I, I see a nod. You have to acknowledge it. Uh, bossy Pants? Yeah. Yes. That, so you want to go back and read Bossy Pants. I saw another one. Going to go back? <laughs> Wonderful. We got to watch the Golden Girls. That's <laughs> I, I can't say that's my cup of tea, but uh, I'll show you my. What I go back and re reread on a regular basis is uh, the Captain Horatio Hornblower series by C. S. Forrester, printed uh, first in 1939. And every time I started reading these when I was a young man. And I go back and reread them every couple years, and uh, it's amazing how, how good they continue to be. Or uh, anyone read read Dune? Frank Herbert's Dune. Man, y'all need to read some good science fiction. I, I'm gonna have to give y'all a list. This, this is one of the best reads. I, I bought this new when I was like 12, and I've just been carrying it around and reading it ever ever since. You know, the funny thing about going back and when you find something really, really good, a great movie, a great book, a great, uh, maybe even a uh, sports game, I don't know, uh, you go back and rewatch them, you look at, them, look at them again, and you find something you didn't find before, right? You go back and there's something more to it. That's what, part of what makes it so great, is there a de there's a depth it. The, the last time I went through and read Dune, Frank Herbert wrote this about 40 years ago, and um, he wrote it in the middle of the time when there was all the oil crisis in the Middle East, and, and this is a commentary on the oil crisis, because this talks about how there's a, there's a planet which supplies spice, and the spice must flow, and there's only one place to get the spice, and if you take spice and change it to oil and talk about the Middle East, this book is all about the Middle East, and I didn't, it took me years of reading it before I realized that, because I started reading it when I was 12, and I just thought it was a great read, and saw it in Barnes and Noble. Um, and so we go back to these things, what, what is truly great, we go back to and we look at them again, and we look at them again, and we go back to them, and we look at them again, and, and it's not just things that happen that way too, it happens with, with people too, we, we, we look at people again. You ever look at someone, and it's like you're seeing them, and you haven't really seen them clearly for a while? First time my wife walked on stage playing Sandy in Greece. Can I tell you the ending of Greece without giving it away? Is there any spoilers? Everyone's seen Greece. Okay, how, how does Greece end? Sandy walks on stage wearing a pink jacket, tight black leather pants, and jumps on Danny Zuko. The first time I saw my wife do that on stage, I looked at her and thought, I haven't seen this side of her before. I mean, you just look at something and sometimes you, whoo. I haven't seen it like that before. That's, that's a new way to see that. And so it, it's not just with uh, books and movies and, and people that looking again becomes so important. We're, we're going to spend this month reading the Gospel of John. And when we read the Gospel of John, learning to look again becomes essential. Because learning to look again, if, if you just take one look at it, it's not going to get you very far. If you just take one look at it, it's, it's likely to be confusing. Uh, who here had the scarlet letter inflicted on them when they were in high school? Scarlet letter, right? Who liked it the first time? 
I hated it the first time. Oh my God, I hated the Scarlet Letter the first time. I can read pretty fast. I sat down, I read it in one sitting so I could be done with the book because I hated it so much and I could go read something I liked. And then I had to go back and read it again later in seminary. And I read it again and you know what? It, it wasn't half bad. I had to look at it again. And, and all of a sudden, it, 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 was, it was meaningful. It was powerful. And, and to, to look at something again, it, it matters. And, and when we come to the Gospel of John, I think of the Scarlet Letter because I have about the same relationship to it. I, I don't like the Gospel of John. Can I, can I be honest with you about that? I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like how it works. I don't like how it reads. I don't like the grammar of it. It, it annoys me. And that's what, every time I read the Gospel of John, that's my first reaction. And then I have to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to read it again, I'm going to look at it again, and we're going to see what happens. And then it gets better. Every time. That, that's what happened this week. I, I, I have known that we're going to preach the Gospel of John the whole month of October. I have known that for four months. And, and I sat down to start doing that this week, to read the Gospel of John. And every time I sat down to read it, I didn't have more than about five minutes. And, and so I would read, it, read this section, I'd read it quickly, I'd look at it and think, huh, I should figure out something about that for a sermon. But I gotta go to a meeting. Oh, I should figure out that something for Sunday. But I gotta go teach Methodism. Oh, I should figure out, but I need to go. And I did that again and again and again. And I got annoyed at the Gospel of John all week until last night. Yes, I'm about to confess this sermon got written last night. Last night, I finally had a couple free hours. And I sat down, 6 o'clock last night, and I started reading the Gospel of John, and I looked at it again. I just didn't glance through it, but I looked at it again. And I, and I looked at the way that it begins with this great cosmic scene, this great cosmic image of the Word and God together, and everything is made through the Word, and how the Word comes to be with us. And, uh, and I noticed something when I looked at it again that it tells us that the Jewish people who should have been the ones first to see the Messiah, they should have been the first ones to notice who the Messiah is, they did not see Jesus. They did not see him. They did not understand who he was because they didn't look again. And I thought, ooh, that hits a little bit close to home. And I read a little bit farther, and, and you read about how John is in here because... God, saw, God knows us pretty well. God knows we, we have an amazing ability to ignore the things. And so John the Baptist shows up. And what is John the Baptist's role? He says, okay, everyone get your attention. Look. Look right there. Do you see what I see? Do you see Jesus? That's what John the Baptist does every time. He just says, okay, everyone stop. Look at Jesus. That's his role. He, get, he tells everyone just to stop what you're doing, drop it, and look again. Because you think you know what's going on. Stop it. Look again. And that really struck home. And it's a tragedy that John the Baptist is needed. Because if anyone should have been able to see the, the Messiah, it's the Jewish folks of the first century, but they didn't. And John the Baptist shows up to point. To say, there he is. Look. Look again. Take another look. And, and so... And then it continues, and, and it says something amazing. Those who look at Jesus, who see Jesus and know who he is, he gives them power to become children of God. He makes them to be children of God. Something about seeing Jesus transforms us when we really see and understand who he is. Because then we see ourselves as children of God. We see ourselves as we are. And so something about seeing Jesus changes how we see everything else. And that's powerful. Because I could ask any one of you to make a list of how you see yourself. And you could, I could ask you, make a list of how you see yourself. And, and, and it's funny how often we would obsess about what, what's messed up. All our problems, all, our, all the things we screw up, all the things we just drop the ball on. And then I say, but look at Jesus. And what this says is when you look at Jesus, he helps you see who you are. A child of God, beloved, forgiven, accepted, and precious. That's powerful. Look again and see, what, see what's different here. When, when, as we read the Gospel of John this month, in this Gospel, it's going to become very important to look again. That is how the Gospel 
functions. This gospel it, it works around the idea that you look once and Jesus says, uh-uh, look again. Again and again, people misunderstand Jesus in the gospel of John and he has to say, no, look again. We need to look again. And that's how the Gospel of John shapes us, to slow down and to look. And so we can look, and this changes how we see the world around us too. I mean, in the middle of the night, you can look up at the stars, and you can look up, look up at the stars, and you can see the cold, distant vastness, the, the, the sheer, stark distances that are just make you feel small and puny. And then you look at Jesus through whom it was all made, look at those stars again, and you see something different. You see how all of creation is made for us to enjoy. You can look at, you can bow your head to look to God in prayer, and you can see, you can see that God seems distant and absent, and you don't know how to find God, and God seems all powerful, but all the way out there. And then you look to Jesus, look again, and... and, and and then you look at Jesus and you see that Jesus, in, in Jesus, God comes to dwell amongst us. And you're not praying to a distant God, you're praying to a heavenly Father who is far closer than we can ever imagine. If you look at Jesus, then look at the person who frustrates you. It's kind of hard to be angry at someone for whom Jesus died, right? I can look at you and be angry all day long. I look at Jesus who says, love your neighbor. I look back at you... Darn it. Jesus loves you. Okay. Kind of hot. Think of the most insurmountable problem in your life right now. The thing that is just causing you fits. Think about how big that problem is. Look at Jesus. Jesus got over being dead. Does your problem look so big anymore? Right? You look at Jesus and then you look again at your life. You look again at anything and what we see changes. Look at Jesus and then look again. We're going to practice in a pr practice this in a pretty practical way in a minute. We're going to practice communion. This is World Communion Sunday. And right now, across the world, 2.18 billion Christians are gathering for communion, as separated by time zones, of course. But there are a bunch of people gathering for communion as a church. And you can look at the church, and if you were having a bad day, you, you and I both know what you could see of, of the church. You could see something struggling, something that has lost its way, something that is shrinking, and something that is just trying to find its path forward. That's what you could see. Then I say, look at Jesus. And what does Jesus see in the church? Revelation tells us that Jesus sees the church as the bride, prepared and ready for him. And because have any of you ever been able to look at a bride and see a problem? No. You look at the bride and you see hope. You see a future. You see possibilities for life together. And you look at this communion together and I don't see problems. I see a church that's gathered across the world and I see how the church is changing and, it, and I see our future and it's a good future. The best part of my week, the single best part of my week, of all the many, many things I did was sitting down with folks Thursday night in the upstairs of Gordo's and with people with whom I shared a meal and I looked at people who are going to join this church. We got some baptisms coming. I can't tell you how good that... Look at Jesus, look at the church and see that we don't gather as this table and we're just trying to make sure there's enough to go around. We gather at this table and there is enough to go around our future is good because we are the bride of Christ. Look at Jesus and then look at the world. Look, take another look and it changes what we see. Now here's the question I want to leave with you with today. Can each of you play John the Baptist for the rest of us? All right. Because what's John the Baptist do? He says, okay, stop. Look right here. Did you see that? That was God. That was good. That was Jesus. Stop and look at that. Because Jesus shows up in our lives. And we should be, of all people, we should be the ones who are really good at finding Jesus. Because we're Christians, right? We gather su every Sunday so we can practice the presence of God, so we can practice seeing God. And the first century Jews should have been really good at finding the Messiah, right? We should be good at this, but you know, folks, let's be honest, sometimes we need a hand. Can you give each other that hand? 
Whenever you see something that is of Jesus, that is of God, that is of, of the goodness of God, can you stop and point it out to each other? Can you play John the Baptist to each other so that no matter what happens, one of us is experiencing the presence of God and the rest of us can join in and say, yeah, that is good. I'm glad I looked again. Amen.